Now the Berians were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Many of the Jews believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. Amen. My soul, let us be one in hope. My soul, let us be one in hope. My soul, let us be one in hope. Holy God, our Father, we thank you. We pray that on this holy and blessed day of the Lord that you have given us, we pray that all your people can worship you in the spirit and blessing, and we thank you for this chance. We pray that all the, your people will be with you, and we pray that they may change and they may serve and worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray that you would help us by the Holy Spirit. We pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Now let us repent of all the aspects of our lives where we have not changed. Now let us repent of all these things and our weaknesses before God. Amen.
Holy God our Father, you have enabled our spirits to experience your great love through the grace of Jesus Christ. And on this blessed day, we who are the members of Christ have gathered and we praise, glory and honor you. We thank you for this opportunity. We pray that as your children, we seek to obey your word and we seek the way of the Spirit and seek to live in a way pleasing to you. Yet we have followed the desires of our flesh and we could not live according to your pleasure. We pray that you will cleanse us by your precious blood and we can see your face again. We pray that as we seek your word, we bow down before the name of Jesus and seek to please you in this worship. And we pray that your holy love and grace may be filled within us. And we pray that we can fulfill your good will in this spiritual worship. Holy God, our Father, we pray concerning the recent difficulties that have faced our church. And although we suffer many challenges, we pray that we can endure till the end and follow the hope entitled in the slogan, my soul, let us be one in hope. We pray that we can please you and we pray that we can worship you in this temple and arm ourselves with your spiritual armor. We pray that we can use all our strength and receive your great power to do your will. We pray that all those souls who succeed in this worship can receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit and we pray that they can also succeed in every other matter as they succeed in their spiritual lives and we pray as they continue to testify to your gospel we pray that we may all follow the movement to return to the word and although your people are suffering in this COVID epidemic, we pray that you would strengthen us. We pray that this epidemic will quickly come to an end and that all will be restored. We pray that we can finally all worship together physically and would worship and praise you to our heart's desires. We pray that all our lives we would follow the word of truth, just as we were fed and nourished by Pastor Kidong Kim. We pray that we may all emulate him in the Holy Spirit. We pray concerning our beloved overseer, that you'd give him all the wisdom and understanding for management of all affairs in the church. We pray that you would empower him with all wisdom and authority. We pray that he may succeed in all the areas of his ministry as you strengthen him. We pray that we can all follow and be worthy of the church. We pray for the beloved overseer that you'd give him all the wisdom, knowledge and power of your word. We pray that he can fully proclaim your word and we pray that we may all be filled with the inspiration of your blood and of your wisdom and of your word. We pray that we may delight in your truth. We pray that we can prepare for the future days and continue to work together in building up your church. We pray that you will deliver us from all evil. In the name of Jesus, we pray in thanksgiving. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. We ask that all who would wish to give their offerings online would do so now while the, hun while the anthem is being sung.
Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Holy God, our Father, we thank you as we all seek to unite in hope. We worship you and we thank you for the chance to give our offerings to you. We pray that you would be with those who have given their tithe offerings. We pray that you will bless all those families who have given their tithes. They are sought to obey you. We pray that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit. We pray for these families who have given their, their great thanks offerings to you. We pray that you will bless them and as they have done this out of love for the church, we pray that you would fill them with joy. We pray for those who have given these offerings to you. They have given their monthly offerings to you. We pray that you would answer their prayers and will bless them. We pray for those who have, for all those who have given their individual and various offerings. We pray that since they have done this and have confessed their faith, we pray that their offerings may be used for your kingdom, glory and power. We pray that you would be with them. In the name of Jesus, we pray in thanksgiving. Amen. May all those who have given their offerings in hope be filled with all the blessings in the name of Jesus.
The word of God is found in Mark chapter 10, verse 46 to 52. It is found in Mark chapter 10, verse 46 to 52. Let us read it together. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, that is, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Amen. Let us now pray earnestly for the sermon entitled Faith Saves You. Let us pray for the overseer that he may be filled with all power and authority. Let us pray now together. Holy God, our Father, we pray that on this holy day of the Lord, that we may receive the word you wish to give us. We pray that you would inspire us all, that whether it be the speaker or those who hear your word, may all experience your great power. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Faith saves you. Let us read the sermon outline together. God is Almighty, as He sent the Word into the world and fulfilled it. Jesus' name is the greatest inheritance in heaven. Jesus' name means it defeats countless kinds of injustices. It is perfect and the name of the Almighty. It is heaven's name and the glory of the only begotten Son. Nothing is impossible with this name. If believers have this name in their hearts, they have authority to become God's children. The blind man could not see anything, but he heard with his ears and called on his name. He defeated all the tempting voices around him and called on Jesus' name. He understood why he had to call on this name and called on it. He believed the answer to his problem is only found in his name. Jesus declared, your faith has saved you. And this man's lifelong wish was fulfilled. The Holy Spirit is always with us to help us in our weakness. Those who come to God should know, should not show pitiful behavior, but show faith. Faith is what God seeks and it is the keys of heaven. Be sure of why you ask for God's help and exalt Jesus' name. Jesus came to save such people. Only Jesus has the glory that is absent in the universe known as Hades. It is his name. Bow before Jesus' name and see its glory. The Lord Jesus came to the world to find believers. He does not look for those who beg earnestly, but those who believe the power of Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus Christ saves those who have the heart of repentance. 
and he seeks those who have the heart for repentance. So those who do not have the heart to repent cannot meet with Jesus Christ. On the other hand, those who have the heart for repentance can meet with Jesus Christ and their spirits will be entrusted to him and so they will always dwell with God so that God can take responsibility for them. So you and I live a life of prayer and this is the way that we can stay connected with God and yet some people think concerning the issue of prayer that they need to pray hard they need to pray hard and consistently persistently so that they will be heard by God they need to pray very diligently and that is the only way that God will hear them so people think this way and this is what has been taught in churches and this, these words are right. However, if we look at it in a different way, when we explain about prayer, the, the perspective must be in the right direction. For if we emphasize this too much, and if we emphasize this too much, it may lead to the misunderstanding that if we pray, if we just pray very diligently and very hard, no matter what we pray for, and we hold stubbornly to it, then in the end, God will hear any prayer. And this makes you, this makes you think that you have some innate authority so that God will listen to any of your prayers. And and this leads to the logic that God has God is powerless to oppose anything that you pray for and God himself has no choice but to listen to your every whim and answer just because you hold stubbornly to prayer and are very diligent in it. It is as if God himself is bound to this principle to listen to whatever you pray for. It means that God has to respect God has to respect your own law and he has to do everything that you say. But this is a wrong understanding. It is as if it is as if our status and God's status are somehow comparable. It is it makes you think that this is somehow comparable and that both both of our laws and God's laws must be taken into account. And so if we do this, we ignore God's law and whatever we pray for, whatever, whenever, if it is our individual or selfish whim, you may lead, it may lead to the misunderstanding that God has to listen to whatever you pray for or whatever you desire. But this is a misunderstanding and we are taking, we are taking the perspective in the wrong way. And in a similar issue, there is another mistake that we often make. We make the mistake that if we somehow pray very diligently and we are very stubborn and tenacious in praying in this way, it makes us think that when we do this, this somehow this somehow justifies our merit that we are somehow we are somehow innately meritorious because we have we have prayed very diligently and so when we do this when we do this we build up our own merit enough so that god will actually listen to our prayers and the mistake that we can make is that if we just, if we have the idea that we just need to pray very diligently and we just need to be persistent and very tenacious and stubborn with it, then finally God will listen to whatever it is. And since we have done this for so long and done this so tenaciously, we have somehow built up our own merit enough so that God will actually listen. 
but this is actually a big misunderstanding. So it is not the built-up merit of our prayers, or about how long we have prayed, or about how hard we have prayed for. And we may be praying for our own benefit, for example, praying for the workplace, or praying for our school grades, or other things, and we may be praying for our own personal success or victories. But if we do, this is not acceptable before God. This is we are praying without knowing our true position and our true state of affairs. So in the end, if we misunderstand that if we just need to pray stubbornly and we just have to be tenacious at it, then this, is, this merely ends up in being a, just a technical device by which we, we can achieve something just by a mere technique. And so, this can lead to the development and concentration only on the technique itself, and it becomes a purely technical issue, where we just need to develop the technique and the working out of this mechanic, so that in the end, God will answer our prayers. But this is not a right attitude. It is as if we just need to get the method correct, and that is all for God to listen to our prayers. So this kind of ideas are not good because God is not someone who bows down to our every whim just because we have asked for it so tenaciously and He is not the one who just listens to whatever our, our desires claim. God is seeking those who are sincere in repentance. He is seeking those who will genuinely repent these people will come to God with genuine repentance and they will confess their state and realize that they are nothing without God. And since they understand this fully, fully, they now change their lives and come to God full-heartedly and they come with sincere repentance to God. So we must come to God with sincerity and genuineness. So we must come to God with a heart for repentance. You and I must seek the compassion of God. And in order to do this, we must show this humility which God sees. We must have this spirit by which we have given up everything and that we have and that we realize that we are in a, a place where we have nothing to hope for except God himself. This is the kind of sincere spirit that God is seeking. People who wish to meet with God must realize that they are nothing, that they have no value and they have no choice but to rely on God himself because they have nothing else. So, when such people who realize these things, when they come to God, then God will start to listen to them. Because it is only when we realize and we behave in this way that God will start to have compassion on us. Because God wants to be compassionate on us. So, we must understand that God has, has come down so low for our sakes and he, has, he is prepared to the full to give us all His compassion and forgiveness. He has made the decision to do this. So, what God wants is for... What God wants is for... for us to show our genuineness so that we can truly we can truly inspire him to move. So no matter how much so-called merit or how much, how much praiseworthy deeds we have done, if we do not show the sincerity of our repentance and do not come to God with any genuineness, then we cannot receive anything from God. So when we, when we teach about prayer, we must not teach anything in any kind of technical way 
For sure, we need to encourage prayer in the church and we need to teach people how to pray. But we must teach people how to connect spirit to spirit towards God when we pray. But if we teach prayer in a purely technical or mechanical way, we are actually deceiving God. God is seeking people who repent and who those and those who wail and cry out with mourning. He is not seeking those who are self-satisfied. And he is not seeking those who think that they can survive by themselves without God. God does not want people who think that they can do all right by themselves. Because uh, such people will disregard the unique grace and unique love that God is ready to give them. But if they take God's love and God's grace as an advantage for their own own personal benefit or success, then this is to be this is not to be accepted at all. And it is especially we must especially be careful to use anything that we receive from the church for our own personal success or personal greed or fulfillment or satisfaction in any way. God will not accept any of such people who think like this. So although we may appear very honorable and very godly on the outside, if we have not sincerely repented on the inside, then we cannot be accepted. For we know that when we repent sincerely, we are willing to change for God's sake. But if we do not show this sincere repentance and the willingness to change through God, then God will not accept such people. Because God looks on those people who are willing to change and repent in sincerity to Him. So God wants to meet with us, but He is the God who comes for the sake of sinners. So while we are on this earth, while we are on this earth, we must understand that God is making this decision for us. So, those who want to come to God must show the sincerity, for God does not come for any other people except for these. If people understand fully that they are sinners, then Jesus Christ will certainly come to them. Jesus came to say Jesus came to search for and save such sinners like these. And even to the end of time, Jesus Christ will only look for humble people who repent. God gives his chance for those who repent, and he does not he does not accept any self-righteous people. If there are any people who think that they are righteous in any way, then God will not accept such people. God came Jesus came to serve sinners. He came to help and deliver sinners, not the righteous. So although we are sinners right now, God will come so that He can eternally restore us. And so He is working to completely change those who are those who will come to God with sincere repentance. So this is the purpose. So, God does not for those who are who only care for the outside, for He only helps those who wish to repent. Rep those who do not repent will never be able to enter God's kingdom. So, repentance is an absolute condition we must meet. Jesus Christ has come to search and save sinners. And God is... God will only look to those who repent as sinners. For only sinners can meet with God. Only sinners can be seen by God. So this is not some kind of choice, as if we will think whether, whether or whether or not we will build up our own righteousness or whether we repent. This is useless because God is very busy. And he cannot, he cannot stray from his decided purpose. 
So we must understand God's nature and characteristic. We must understand the sincerity of God and what He has permitted us. For if we do not wish to repent as sinners, then we are completely opposite from the nature of God Himself. So the church is on this earth. However, those things, those things which work well in the world do not work well in the church. They are not alike, the world and the church. Therefore, the church and the world must be must have a clear division and distinction. And yet, unfortunate as it is, some people are unable to let go of the elements of the world and they still come to the church. And people, and, and we have had no choice but to accept such people for so long in the church. We have preached the gospel to so many people and since we have the need to to save as many people as quickly as possible, yet people have this misunderstanding. For if we, if we are not careful about these issues, then we can, we can enter great danger. We must keep hand in hand with God and we must always dwell with God in the, in the environment that He wants. But if we do not do this, we, we, cannot, we have no choice but to always be in a constant, anxious and very insecure state. So although some people are not yet fully ready to let go of the world, we must know these things. So there are many people who do not, who do not make the difference between the world and the church. And there are even people who work harm against the church. Although, although these, is, these are very great matters, yet some people justify and, and they explain away their own evil deeds. For example, some people say, oh, the pastor said and did this, and this is why I'm behaving in this way. And some other saints will say, oh, this believer did this to me, and so this is why I'm acting in this way. And although we can listen one by one, they may sound, they may sound uh, appropriate, and yet this is actually not right. Because it'll end up in elements of the world infiltrating the church. If we have these kinds of worldly ideas to come into the church, and, and then people with these worldly ideas will start to propagate, propagate very worldly and very instable attitudes and ideas, then this causes, gr this causes great troubles. So some people, some members of the church have attended church for so long and they think that this is a merit in themselves, this is a great accomplish accomplishment in themselves, and so they may misunderstand that God, that Jesus is seeking those who have great achievements. So God is not interested at all in how much achievements and how much so-called merits we have attained. God is asking whether we will repent. Have you truly repented as a sinner? Are you truly repenting? And do you truly recognize that you are sinners? Do you truly recognize what you need to do to to show that you are sinners and that you wish to repent. Are you doing the duty and the deeds required of you as those who repent and as those who confess that they are sinners? Are you bearing the proper fruit of repentance? Are you behaving in the responsive way as sinners? So God is looking for these kinds of people. And there are unfortunately many people and many groups who are working great harm and, and indescribable evil against the church. There are always such kinds of people and groups and, and some of these groups some of these groups will say, come on, it is our duty to improve the church. We must fix these problems in the church. So let us gather together or let us pray together to, to address this problem. And so, 
Also, as good as it sounds at first, although they gather, then they gather together, and then they think they are actually building up their own righteousness. And even though, even though they know that their original tent was actually evil, yet because there are already several people gathered at once, they think that this reason is justified. So they are plating, they are plating these evil intents and motives with gold. And they are, wash they are whitewashing their evil intent. And so they start to reason to themselves that it is okay to make the church stumble. And then they actually actively oppose the church so that they can whitewash and plate, plate their evil intent with gold. But God does not accept this righteousness at all. Although they are whitewashing their, their unbelievably evil intent, and these people justify their evil, their evil desires. And so, and yet these people still dare to pray very diligently so that God will grant them their purpose. All that God is seeing is people who do not repent. So it only results in it only results in the increasing need for repentance. So although although people view things by worldly values and worldly perspectives, and then a group of people start to agree that this is right, yet and yet at the same time. Disobedience grows because of this, and God does not look favorably on such people. And so, although we cannot, although it appears that that God is not instantly punishing them, so they confuse it that God accepts this, and then they start to they start to sugarcoat and whitewash these evil motives and purposes. And they start to reason, reason out their evil beliefs. And they say that they are right. But as they do this, they slowly forget about God himself. So what we, must what we must understand is that repentance is an attitude that we must continue until the very end. It is a decisive, a decisive and imperative role that we must do. This is repentance. We have this immortal duty to repent, but those who do not will bring about the wrath of God on themselves. So what the problem is, is not the technique or actual deed that we are doing. But the best, the best thing that we can hope for the best way for us to arouse God's concern is by repentance. So if we do not repent and we continue in evil deeds, this is a great problem. And then the sins, people's sins will not be erased. And there is an even greater fear than this. Not only do people not wish to change their evil deeds, but they, ha they do not have the desire to repent at all. So this is an even greater sin, the, the absence of any, any desire to repent and to acknowledge that people are sinners. So just this, this comes about by the idea, the misplaced idea that God cannot see the inside of your heart. So if so, s once people realize that they can get away with deceiving uh, people that they see with their eyes and they see they're actually successful, then they get the conclusion that they can that they are actually deceiving God himself. Yet God is looking at everything. So it is a it is a wonder where that they got this idea that they can get away with this because they so I believe it come these this these ideas of willful disobedience and willful refusal to repent comes from the 
mistaken idea that God is unlimitedly patient, patient and that he will forgive every sin and have mercy on everything. So, God, yet on the other hand, God does not detest and refuse those who repent. So no matter how much we have repented, God will, God will joyfully accept those who repent and come to God with sincere repentance. So God will come with open arms for those who sincerely repent. So God knows everything, even the deep, the deep insides of our heart. So if we get, so it is impossible to deceive God and come to God only on the outside, and yet we are we are willingly refusing to repent. God sees all things. So God is God is so God is well prepared. He is very willing and and he is keen on accepting with wide open arms those who wish to come to him with repentance. He is very ready to bless and accept those who will repent. Our duty is to move God to open up his arms by repenting. We should not take this lightly. We must understand how we could perhaps move God, how we can move God by our entreaty. We must realize, we, once we realize that God has made all these sacrifices and then we, we give up our own righteousness and we come to God as sinners, then we will be instantly accepted by God. So if people give up their own righteousness and they do their duty faithfully, even though they realize that they are complete sinners and they realize that they will never be acceptable at all in any way, then they will be accepted because they are merely humbly and faithfully doing their duty because they realize that the righteousness of Christ has come upon them in this graceful way. There is, a, there is a reason why we cannot refuse God's request. And the reason is, is that we used to be children who were ready to be thrown into hell. Yet God has sent His own Son as a sacrifice to save our spirits. So, God will willingly come to those who repent. And those who repent will bear fruit, the fruit of repentance. So, the reason why we should not deceive God is because we have the urgent duty to bear fruit in keeping with our repentance. There needs to be the proof of our, of our repentance. Although we, can, although we can certify things in other ways, yet what we need to prove most surely by, uh, by open proof is our sincere repentance. There is no way to pro prove our sincere repentance except by uh, the bearing of our good fruit. We, can we may deceive all other people, but we cannot deceive God. So God has given this very small, this, ver this very light opportunity. So we should not refuse this, but we should actively bear fruit to prove our repentance. So although we were children of wrath and destined for death, yet God had mercy on us because of his compassion. And this mercy does not stop here, but it continues to go on to the next generation, for this is what God wants. So since we are in the middle, we must take this mediatory role to spread all these things to the next generation, and we must prove this by our deeds. We must prove God's abounding mercy by our deeds. What God is saying is that we must bear fruit in keeping with our repentance. This is what John the Baptist said. Those who repent will show this behavior and will show it in their lives about how they much how much that they have changed. 
And even when the apostles and the early church went around preaching the gospel, wherever they went in preaching the gospel, they always urged that they needed to, and then they needed to do good deeds to prove their repentance. So, wherever they were, the apostles exhorted the people to repent and prove their repentance by their deeds. So the question is, do you, are you sinners? Do you recognize that you are sinners and that you repent? Then prove this by bearing good fruit. Do you see a way to live before you? Then prove it. Do you want to live? Then, And do you want to also repent? Then prove this by your open deeds. We have received this new covenant clear for all. Just as Jesus initiated this new covenant with his disciples, this is open for us today. So, we must show the decision for our sincere repentance by putting this to action. We must never disgrace the spirit of we must never dishonor the spirit of grace. We must take the opportunity when God is being very merciful, but we must not take advantage of this. So at any time, our church must remain in God's grace so that our church, spiritually speaking, will fully be able to receive God's grace and that we can 100% repent. We must not, we must not make these vague assumptions that we will somehow be acceptable to God. So when, when we have the opportunity to receive the blood that Jesus is shedding for us, we must repent, we must prove the grace that we have received. This must become our this must become our special characteristic. This must become our inner nature, which must never change. This is what I exhort to you all in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So if we look at today's passage, by looking at today's passage, we see that Jesus performed a great miracle. So this is when Bartimaeus had his eyes opened by Jesus. So this is the last place in this is the last place where Jesus is mentioned to perform a miraculous sign. So there were small exceptions, yet yet primarily speaking, this is the last time that he performs his healing because he now ends his open ministry that we that he started three years ago at this point and what happens for the remainder of his stay this is the time for Jesus's suffering so all that is left is for Jesus to suffer and to die on the cross and so he ended everything with the healing of Bartimaeus. So, so we have seen, we have seen all the various behaviors and interaction that Jesus had with James and John and the other disciples. And yet we cannot speak about this now. Yet we can see that the extensive ministry and healing that Jesus performed on all the blind and deaf people and Bartimaeus along with many other people instantly had their eyes opened and it was only after Jesus rose from the dead that they realized the importance of what Jesus had done really was and so and so Bartimaeus also realized all these things after Jesus resurrected and he showed the maturi the maturity of his faith so much so that that he was permitted to be mentioned in these in these in these gospels in the Bible so Jesus was headed from Jer from Jericho to Jerusalem 
And so he, along with all of his followers, were headed for Jerusalem. They had witnessed the extensive miracles and healings that Jesus did as he went around in various places. They had seen, they had seen all that he had done in the various countryside towns. And now they saw Jesus boldly heading for the destination in Jerusalem. So he was closing all accounts. Why was Jesus and all his followers headed for Jerusalem? So although it appeared that he may he may have been coming to celebrate the Passover, but this but people knew anybody who knew understood that this was not just the case. Because because Jesus' true intent was finally shown by his interaction with Bartimaeus. So he was headed to Jerusalem from Jericho. If you look at the geography, the geographical position of Jericho and Jerusalem, you know that you have no choice but to pass through Jericho because you cannot go through Samaria because there is always conflicts with Samaritans. So you have the only choice to pass through Jer Jericho. This is the only way to enter Jerusalem. And so this three-year journey was finally coming to a close at Jerusalem. And so if we look more specifically, we know that Jesus only had a few hours left before he finished everything in Jerusalem. And the last, and the last, uh, one of the last events that he came across was his dealings with Bartimaeus. So in other places it deals with how the early church had dealt with things, and yet right now Jesus now deals with Bartimaeus that is, the son of Timaeus. So we see that Bartimaeus was a beggar. He was, he was a homeless person. Because in these agricultural societies, as in Judea and Jerusalem, you were wholly dependent, you were wholly dependent on the work of your handheld labor. Because because if people were not strong enough to produce handheld labor, then you could not gain any living. And this was the case for the blind man Bartimaeus. So he became, he became stricken from society as if somehow he had done something wrong because he could not fulfill his daily labor because his body was weak. And so in, Ju in uh, Jerusalem society, the survival, the survival of the fittest was the rule. And if you were unable to make any money, then you were considerably looked down upon and, and earning a livelihood was scarce and very difficult. So this is the way that the people of the past looked at things. So those who were with Jesus uh, were walking to Jerusalem and he walked to a, a very popular, very often walked road which many people took to go to Jerusalem. So in the month of Passover, Passover many people entered, many people entered Jerusalem at this time. And, and yet because of the immense amount of followers that were following Jesus, they could not believe this. They could not believe what he was doing because these things were amazing to behold people who passed who saw these things would ask what is happening right now what is happening and the often reply was Jesus of Nazareth is passing by with his disciples and so the moment the moment that Jesus heard the moment that Bartimaeus heard this he instantly came upon his feet and would shout out so that Jesus would hear in a very loud voice, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. If we look at the Bible passage here, it says that he he spoke aloud. This does not mean that he he spoke aloud in a in a in a moderate manner, but that he was shrieking 
with full volume in his voice, so much so that he was he was almost about to ruin his his voice and his vocal box because he used all of his strength to shout out loud with a great cry and shriek so that Jesus could hear. And although, G although the passers-by said this is Jesus of Nazareth who was passing by, yet the way that G the way that Bartimaeus heard and understood this was that this was Jesus, the son of David. Of course, he may have already heard about who Jesus was, yet he replied that Jesus was the son of David. So, from a purely human perspective, this is very shocking. We might say, we might say that the way that Bartimaeus addressed Jesus was in a very honorific and very respectful manner. This was set apart from all the other ways that people addressed Jesus. And so he said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. This was a very unique way that Jesus was called. You can speak to Je you can speak to teachers in very other honorable ways. For example, rabbi or rabboni. So, if you, a person was called lord or teacher, they were someone of reasonable respect and position. Like, sir, may I help you, sir? So this is a term for respect. And yet, what was so different with Bartimaeus was that Jesus, that Jesus was called the son of David. So the only way, the only time that this phrase was used was very, it's way back from when God promised David himself that one of his descendants would would receive the promise to sit on the throne for all time. And so God had promised, God had promised the Israelites that the descendant of David would someday sit on the throne to restore all things. So this did not refer to Jerusalem this is not referred to uh, Solomon, but what was so special with Bartimaeus is that he concluded that Jesus was the son of David. So who was the one who would come as the son of David? So Gabriel, the, an the archangel, said the message to, to Mary. Mary, do not be afraid to take, uh, to take, uh, do not be afraid of what is happening and to be afraid. And so, this was pre-announced even by the angel Gabriel about Jesus being the son of David. So this was mentioned only a very few times. And yet, and yet Bartimaeus saw this clear in clear view, and yet his insight was different from everyone else's. For he he awakened the, he awakened the way that Jesus was called in the past. And also what was characteristic of Bartimaeus' behavior was that he showed fully that he was completely unable, he was completely unable to save himself. He was unqualified. He had no value or qualifications at all. He was worthless. He had nothing in himself and he merely asked God to have compassion on him. And so in this way, he, en he entrusted himself completely to God, that he was completely in God's hands and that he could not do anything except rely on God. So in this way, he cried out to God and exclaimed that he was worthless without God and that he could do nothing without him. And so he had nothing but to fall down before God. So the, this attitude that, that Bartimaeus had 
is very overshadowed by the fact that he is a blind person. So all that we can see from face value is that he was a blind person and that we cannot see anything else. But we must, we must look at this with more depth. Because the behavior that Bartimaeus had towards Jesus was very unique, unlike any of the people or even the apostles. So he passed through all, all the teachings and research of the theologians and teachers without any of their help. And he concluded all by himself that Jesus was the son of David. And he also confessed that he was a sinner, that he was, com he was completely useless without God. He was wholly dependent on him and he had no value and no qualifications by himself. So he merely begged God that God would have mercy and compassion on him. So, so in one go, Bartimaeus showed the way to move God. Yet, yet people who passed by instantly rebuked him and told him to be quiet. And even even the people who were in front of the crowd, which was following Jesus, they they tried to quickly uh, quickly tell Jesus to be quiet, quickly tell uh, Bartimaeus to be quiet. They asked, they told him to stop, and they told him to get away. And so it appeared as if they had something much more important to deal with. What was the more important thing? What was this important thing that they were about to meet? And so, the people who followed Jesus, they wrongly judged Bartimaeus and they quickly dismissed him. Yet despite this, Bartimaeus would, did not give up, but he continued with deep humility and deep dependence on God, and so he begged Jesus to help him. Because Bartimaeus knew that the only way, the only hope for him to be healed was for Jesus to heal him. And there was, no, there was going to be no other way for him to be healed or to meet the, or to meet the solution of the problem. So, fortunately enough, fortunately enough, everything, everything came in place. He did not, he was not ever taught this, but he understood this on his own and he shrieked out with all his voice for Jesus to help and have compassion on him. So he called out, he called out like mad towards God. So Jesus finally, Jesus finally heard and accepted the man's request, and he told, he told Bartimaeus to come to him. And then, the moment that Jesus called Bartimaeus in, the people who had just previously rebuked Bartimaeus now had a lighter tone and said, "Cheer up! He's calling you. Be on your feet." And the moment that the disciples said this, Bartimaeus let go of his cloak that he was wearing. So we must understand that the way that Jewish people at this time would regard a piece of clothing was like their almost like their entire ownership. So each person only had just one or two pieces of clothing and that was all. They had no other further piece of clothing. So a person's cloth was like their own estate. It was everything that they ever owned. So Bartimaeus gave this up instantly and he went to follow Jesus. He went... So he came before Jesus finally. And then Jesus said, What do you want me to do for you? And it also says, it also says 
내심으로 감동되다 합니다. 내심으로 속으로 감동되다. It also says that Jesus had compassion on them. So it means that Jesus was touched by Bartimaeus' entreaty. He, Jesus was deeply moved. So we must we must deep we must dwell into the original meaning of this word for compassion. So Jesus was deeply moved. He was deeply inspired by this humble and very sincere behavior of Bartimaeus. So it is for it is for these kinds of humble, very sincere and genuine people that God had come to them through Jesus. Because Jesus is the one that was sent by God the Father. And then Bartimaeus replied, Rabbi, I want to see, as found in Mark chapter 10, verse 51. So he wanted to recover his sight. And from that time on, he wanted to be healed forever of his blindness. So the word that the word that Bartimaeus used to address Jesus here was Rabboni. It was Rabboni. And what this means is my master, or we can say teacher. It is the most elevated title, most honorific title that a person could ever ever give to a teacher at that time. And so several other people use this term. For example, Mary Madeline and her brother and sister and many other people, they use this extremely elevated title to honor Jesus. Not only did he confess that he was the Son of God, but he was the one who created all things. And although he is God himself, yet he had stooped so low so that he could meet with such, fil with such a filthy sinner like himself. And Jesus has come for this purpose, to enable God's people to start the fruit of works of service. So if we look, if we look at the entire context of what we are saying, we have mentioned this before in previous weeks that that the disciples such as James and John were fighting for seats of authority in the future kingdom of Jesus. But the way that Bartimaeus behaved was completely different. He was very humble and repentant. So although other people will boast about their own righteousness and they boast of, the have, of having done this or that or how, a bit, how able they are to do this or that, yet Jesus, yet Jesus replied, Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. So the word that Jesus had used for faith has healed you was that this extended not just to the physical realm, but it also extended to the realm of the spirit. So faith and healing have a relationship. Yet what we must not misunderstand is that faith is not the sole reason in itself, in itself so that God can achieve his healing, but it is kind of like a kind of like a method. It is not because a person's faith is so-called very strong and very urgent and diligent that God will ever listen to them. So, so faith is, should not be mistaken for the willful, very strong mind and focus that you somehow will be healed. We are not talking about this. For, for Bartimaeus did not have such did not have such low views about faith. He because even Jesus even Jesus Jesus healed people who did not have very strong faith. 
So when we talk about faith, we are not talking about this persistent focus and mental strength that we that we apply so that somehow we will be able to achieve the miracle of God. This is a kind of magic. This is a kind of deception. So what so when we talk about faith, we must clarify what is it that we believe? It is the belief that we have nothing in ourselves to boast of ever. That we ourselves have no choice but to sit between two sinners. Yet God is God has sent someone to save us, and this is Jesus Christ. And it is to him that we belong, and this is faith. We are not talking about tenacity or persistence. This is not the way for us to meet with God. So the way for us to meet with God is faith. And the one who and the one who brings us low is Jesus himself. So Jesus said, "Go, your faith has healed you," said Jesus. So although he did not tell Bartimaeus to follow him, yet Bartimaeus humbly followed Jesus. So it is a very normal thing for people to voluntarily follow Jesus. So we must know that this is the steady method for all. We must first have faith, then salvation, and so on. And so, at the time again, we go back, the disciples spoke very rebukingly of, of Bartimaeus. And yet, Bartimaeus truthfully spoke at every corner. So, so Bartimaeus confessed that he was the Son of God. He confessed that he was holy and holy repent holy relying on Jesus. He confessed that he was himself, had no value and was worthless. So all these things that Bartimaeus, the blind, the blind man, had discovered was the real reason why Jesus had come. And then Jesus, Jesus spread this out loud for all. So what Jesus was asking for is not any money, and he was not seeking any personal gain, but he only wanted to save people. So I commend it in the name of Jesus that you yourselves will behave in the same way as Bartimaeus and that you, like him, will come with sincere repentance and that you will humble yourselves in this holy, reliant attitude and method towards God. Let us pray. So we must understand that there is no reason for us to keep any of our own hope for we must hold on at all costs to the utmost to the compassion of Jesus. I ask you and encourage you that you all devote yourselves with great courage, love and faithfulness. Let us all let us all do the work that Jesus himself had done on this great work known as the church. Now let us pray together. Let us pray that God will accept us, that we can offer ourselves in a most acceptable and worthy and sincere way before God. Holy God our Father, we pray that, that you would take a hold of all those who have heard your word. We pray that you inspire us all, and we pray that you who are full of compassion and mercy 
would open your hearts to us. We pray that we will have the wisdom and the humility and repentant attitude to move you. We pray that we may do our utmost sense of duty to please you. We pray that we may all come to you with repentance. We pray that we may please you. And we pray that we may all run step by step with you. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now let us all stand up. Let us all sing this praise together. So it is not us as individuals who meet with God, but we build up this experience with God day by day. And we will all continue to build this up together.
할렐루야. 할렐루야. 이제는 may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the great love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all the people of God who worship along with all their families forever. Amen. Now let us sit down and we can watch the prepared video for us. Our devotion is preparing for the future. Sungwak Church. Sungwak Church to me is the first step of my faith. It is the first step of my experience with God. It is where I have first started my life of faith. Sungwak Church is the place where I can truly connect with the church and with Jesus. It is the place where I can show that I am a Christian. It is the place where I remember how sincere God is. And it is the place which reminds me that I want to live a life better and better each day. I want to give my whole life in devotion to Sangwak Church. Building up the church step by step is the true wish of my life. Me and my family truly like the place, like the, like the retreat called the Mong Sampo Summer Retreat of Sangwak Church. This is where our family truly loves to go. But all because of the corona epidemic, we cannot go there right now, but we are, wish, we are wishing that we can come there very soon. We know that Sangwak Church is the first stepping, ste first stepping stone to our faith. As we continue to, as we continue to genuinely obey with humility, we will continue to build up the church which is the cornerstone of faith in Jesus. Let us continue to labor and toil as we have continued, as we have continued until now. As we continue to put our hope in heaven and as we are suffering many trials because of the challenges coming against us, and because of the COVID epidemic, we seek to receive the Lord's comfort. Love for the church and devotion will all be celebrated in this upcoming devotion worship. Let us continue to build up this grace. Let us love other people's souls in this church, we will fulfill this. Let us prepare for the next generation and for the future. We will begin today. Let us respect the church. Let us respect other people's. And let us, with joy and thanksgiving and devotion, continue this work of growth. Thank you, and we love you. So, we are now diligently preparing for this upcoming devotion worship commemoration period for the 28th of November. And so for a period of seven weeks, we will begin the period of dedication and preparation for the upcoming climatic worship on the 28th of November 
Let us continue to do our duty to protect and restore the church. This is what we must all all do. We just, let us prepare for the future. And let us all pray together and work for this success. And although the time is tight, there is an extra extra announcement that we should all hear from the legal team of Sangmak Church. Hallelujah. I give an announcement from the legal team of Sangmak Church. A group of 29 pastors from the separation party have, have given a, a legal complaint and desire, desire for the prohibition of function and duties towards the church and towards the senior overseer, Pastor Kirong Kim. And although these group, these leaders, these leading pastors in the separation party have made this complaint, it has now completely been acquitted for the victory of Sangwak Church. Although pastors ought to have the duty to respect and to honor the work of Sangwak Church and to do all their duty to honor the church, the overseer, and Pastor Kidong Kim, yet they have completely neglected their duties. They have continued to produce false witness, false witness and testimonies, and they have stand they have stood at the forefront into opposing and to produce libel and and personal and personal accusations and personal personal smear campaigns against the church and all its leaders to produce this shameful conduct and yet uh, the the recent verdict of the legal courts have acquitted have acquitted these complaints and these requests for for the success and victory of Sangwak church and it recognizes it it recognizes that its complaints are not valid and and recognizes that these these group this group that has made this complaint have themselves actively participated in unle in illegal deeds against the peace and harmony of the church and it fully recognizes it fully recognizes fully recognizes uh, fully recognizes that the church have endured much much harm and damage because of the sep because of representatives of the separation party so we can see for see as it is very clear that god has given us this victory and the whole church and the whole church has suffered greatly we can see that this is the righteous righteous decision of god and so we can praise God for this sure victory that God continues to give our church as, as we can see in these recent victorious cases in the legal courts since the requests and complaints have completely been acquitted against our church. Thank you very much. So let us all stand up and give God this praise and glory. So let us all be strong. Thank you very much. Oh
Yeah. 